Well, today we're starting a new book of the Bible. Today is our first Sunday of combined services. Of course, I thought it would be a great big day and lots of people. That was before we knew of this that's going on and the restrictions and so forth. And frankly, I'll have to tell you, I'm surprised as many folks showed up today as have. I didn't know if there'd be a, but a couple of folks. I didn't figure any of our elderly people would be here, but I see some folks 90 and beyond. I would guess they qualify as elderly, huh? Yeah. So we have some brave folks that are here this morning. And again, folks, we live, let's continue to live our lives and to trust in the Lord using all the prudence we can. This new book of the Bible we're looking at is a small one. In fact, the two smallest books in all of Scripture are 2nd and 3rd John. And today we begin 2nd John. For nearly 40 years now, I have taken the Word of God and I have preached verse by verse by verse through it, explaining its meaning. And something that actually comes as a surprise to me is that all my ministry, I've had people say to me, can I have learned more about Scripture while attending your church than I have in my entire life previous? In fact, my buddy, one of the men in our church, just told me that a few moments ago. Well, it's not because I'm a great teacher. It's because I decide to teach. That's what I'm doing. I'm not simply getting up and talking about the love of God and how to get along with your spouse and how to be a good witness in the workforce and all of those things, which are good in and of themselves. But I have this conviction that I was called to preach the word. And I thought 40 years ago, there's no better way to do that than to open the Bible and go verse by verse through it. Study, research, try and understand what's there and then convey it to you. You know, preachers get into this race to get as many, many people as they can into their church. Let's build up our great, great church and we can do all these kinds of things and we can have great numbers and, and that is good. But what's the motive behind that? I... I decided that I'm going to teach, I'm going to preach the truth, and if people come, great. And if we have 12 people here, thank you, Jesus, for 12 people who want to hear the Word of God. And uh, if we wind up getting 1,200, wonderful, 1,200 have come, but we are not and never will seek to just build a great church for the sake of having a big, big, big church. Now, I've taught you over and over again, before reading any of the 66 books of the Bible, you have to, deter you have to uh, uh, determine some information beforehand, or you can't possibly know what that book means, what that writer is saying. You need information, information such as what kind of book is it? I mean, is it... History? Is it a, a gospel? Is it a letter that was written to someone? Is it apocalyptic literature, the kind that talks about the future, what's coming way out? I mean, what kind of book is it? And then you say, who's the author? Who, who wrote this book? I mean, that's pretty important to know, isn't it? And, and who is the recipient or who are the recipients? Who is he writing that book to? When was it written? Because there are things that were going on in, when the Bible was written, various things with, that were going on at that particular time that will have an effect on what the author is saying and what's going on in the community and so forth. And then, of course, every book has a purpose. What is the purpose? What was the thing? What was the author really trying to convey 
in that book. These things are important to know before you ever start reading. And of course, you can find the answers to these questions at the beginning in the prologue of every book if you have a good study Bible, and it's important to have a good study Bible. It'll give you all that information. The three most prominent apostles in all of the New Testament are surely Peter, James, and John. And as you know, I've spent the last year covering the epistles of Peter, James, and John. We just finished 1 John. The same John who wrote the gospel bearing his name and the epistle of 1 John is the author of this book that we're starting today. He also wrote 3 John as well as the book of the Revelation. This is not the John known as the Baptist. It's John the Apostle. And I recently told you that of the 27 books of the New Testament, Paul wrote 14 of them. More than half of all the New Testament books was written by the Apostle Paul. If you credit him with the book of Hebrews, which some scholars do not. But John, the Apostle John, he wrote five of those 27 books. That leaves eight other books. Luke wrote two. Peter wrote two. James wrote one. Matthew, Mark, and Jude wrote one as well. 27 books of the New Testament. As you see, John was exceeded only by Paul in the number of books authored. Today we're going to begin a short study of the epistle of 2 John, a letter that he wrote. You'll see who he wrote it to in just a few moments. It'll take us only three Sundays to get through this entire book of 2 John. And then we'll look at 3 John, and it'll take only two sermons, two weeks, to cover it. But let's first refresh our memory as to who this John is. Let's understand who the writer is. Both scripture and history record that John the Apostle played a very, very major role in the early church. He came to be known as the Apostle of Love. You knew that, didn't you? John was the apostle of love. He wrote more than any other New Testament writer about the importance of us loving one another. The importance of us loving everyone, regardless of who they are. He talked a lot about the Christian's love for Christ, Christ's love for his church. And the love that Christians, especially the love that Christians are to have for one another, that is supposed to be the hallmark of our faith. When the unbelievers looked at Christians, they said, behold, how they love one another. They were amazed at how these people loved one another. And you read John's gospel, this three epistles, you can't escape seeing the love, the theme of love that flows all the way through. John had a brother, by the way, a brother by the name of James. Their father was Zebedee. They were fishermen by trade. James and John, these two brothers, were so very, very close. You can tell that from your reading. We see them often in Scripture and especially alongside Jesus. They were considered to be a part of the Lord's inner circle. They witnessed the raising of Jairus' daughter. Remember that, which was an amazing event in Scripture. It was James and John that witnessed the transfiguration. Remember that? According to Luke, it was John and Peter who were sent to prepare the Passover meal, the Last Supper. James and John, by the way, they were quite feisty. 
feisty brothers. They got the nickname Sons of Thunder. In fact, these guys were so upset with the Samaritans because the Samaritans were inhospitable to Jesus that they called for fire to be rained down upon them. God, this is what you need to do to them. They're going to be inhospitable to Jesus. Just rain fire down from heaven and consume them. It was Paul who referred to John as one of the pillars of the Jerusalem church. John's prominence is also seen in the book of Acts as it's recorded that he traveled extensively in ministry. It was John who Jesus spoke to when he was hanging there on the cross. He committed his mother, Mary, to John's care. John would have been a very young man at that time when he witnessed the Lord being crucified, probably only in his 20s. And even though other apostles surely would have been present at the crucifixion, we assume that, but Scripture mentions only by name John as having been there. John's the only apostle who didn't die a martyr's death. All 11 of the others died for their faith. John, it is believed, died a natural death death at an old, old age. He lived longer than any of the others. As I said, dying a natural death on the island of Patmos around the year 98 AD. Now keep this in mind. When you're reading John's writings, the Lord Jesus had been dead. He was crucified 65 years earlier. Meaning John would have been in his late 80s into his 90s at this time. So John was the last man standing, so to speak. And he would have written this book that we're looking at today shortly before his death. While he was living and ministering in Ephesus. It appears that he wrote his gospel and the three epistles around the same time. He would have written the book of the Revelation, which was the last book just before he died when he was exiled on the island of Patmos. So that means that the Apostle John was the last contributor to Holy Scripture. An important guy. Someone who lived with Jesus who received firsthand the Lord's message. Many of the early church fathers who did a lot of writing in the second century would in all likelihood have known John personally. He would have influenced them. He would have given his firsthand testimony of Jesus to them. You know, it's interesting that John never refers to himself by name in any of his five books. In the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. And a lot of people have had fun with that one. I mean, he sort of saw himself as the Lord's favorite, if you will. You know, I always thought I was my mom's favorite. Not because she told me that, I just... So assume that I was. I think that's what John did as well. But it was a way of portraying himself as this intimate and this beloved companion of the Messiah. At the Last Supper, John was seated right next to Jesus. It says he was leaning upon the Lord. And... Uh, I guess I should point out that the critics love to portray Jesus and John as homosexual lovers. Of course, the critics also portray Mary Magdalene as the Lord's lover as well. You would expect critics to do that. Let me tell you 
that at the time of this writing, the church, the early church, Christianity, would have been about 70 years old. And you can't understand the book of 2 John unless you understand what was going on in the culture, what was going on in the life of the church at that time. The great diaspora had occurred in 70 AD. You know, that was the dispersion of the Jews when Jerusalem fell, the temple was destroyed. The Jews were scattered. But not only were the Jews scattered, the Christians were scattered. The Romans had had enough. So full-scale persecution was enforced against the Jews. And they saw Christians as a part of Judaism. And it was, actually. And so the Romans wanted to do away with all of them. And what a lot of folks do not know is that by this time, Many of the Christians that had been won to the Lord were abandoning their faith. They were so discouraged that they couldn't take it any longer. They had prayed and prayed as they watched family members and other brothers and sisters being killed, persecuted, and they would pray for their deliverance and for the Lord to save them, and He didn't. And so they became so very discouraged, even cynical, that the church was losing members left and right. There was trouble unlike any yet reported in the New Testament. And there was a new generation with new problems. You see, most of the first generation Christians had died, leaving the future of Christianity in the hands of their children and to newer converts. By this time, new debates were flaring up in the church. There, in some local churches, was a mass exodus of people. Many of the churches were splitting off and congregations were going here and going there. And it's interesting to see 2,000 years later the church still doing that kind of stuff. And guess what John called these breakaway folks? He called them Antichrist. That was John's name for them. These people that were teaching false stuff, these people that were causing problems in the church, he called them antichrist. He called them that because they were against Christ. Do you know that the only time the word antichrist is used in scripture, it's in the books of 1st and 2nd John, these two books that we've been looking at. The only time that word is used. And most people tend to think that the word antichrist refers to someone who comes at the end of time. Now, at the end of time, during what is called the tribulation period, there will be someone who will be identified as the man of lawlessness. And that man will sit in the temple of God and he will claim to be God himself. You can see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Revelation talks about a beast that's going to wage war against God's people. And most theologians tend to believe that this person, this man of lawlessness, will be known as the Antichrist. But that's not the person that John is referring to here in his letters, 1 John and 2 John. He was talking about people who were calling themselves Christian, but their beliefs were very, very much against and opposed to what Jesus actually stood for. Let me also tell you in this introduction to 2 John, even though we sometimes see 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John referred to as general epistles, only 1 John is truly general in nature. A general epistle is called such because it's not addressed to any particular group, town, 
or person. A general epistle was intended to be circulated among all the believers everywhere. Well, as, as you'll see, this book of 2 John and the book of 3 John are written to a particular individual. Yeah. 2 John that we're looking at today was addressed to a lady. To a lady. One's name is not given. Whose name is not given. We don't know who the lady was. He calls her a lady. John the elder to the lady. Third John is addressed to a man named Gaius. And we'll be looking at third John in just a few weeks. Therefore, these letters were personal ones. I mean, you need to understand that. The book of Zechariah John, he wrote this to a lady. And you and I take that book and we say, what did he have to say to this lady? How does it apply to us? What we, can we learn from what he wrote to this lady? Third John, he wrote to a man named Gaius, a personal letter. So these were personal letters, not general ones. Now, if you just start reading a book, just like Second John, without all this background information, you really have no idea why John wrote this unless you know what was going on at the time. Now, the Christians of John's day would have understood very well what was going on. They would have known it better than we know. As you may remember, the Christian church at this particular time, a very critical point in its history was doing battle with heretics. For example, these heretics in the church were saying such things as Jesus was a spirit being. He only pretended to have a physical body. They were saying things like, Jesus only pretended to die. He really didn't die at all. Now, you're smart enough to know that if that were true, if these heretics were right, you know how that would affect us and our faith. He didn't really die? Well, if he didn't really die, then he didn't pay for our sins. If he didn't really die, he was never resurrected. And these were the kinds of things that were being taught these teachings were actually the beginnings of a later heresy that developed. You've heard of it known as Gnosticism. The word Gnosticism <laughs> refers to knowledge. You see, the Gnostics, they didn't see themselves as heretics. They saw themselves as people who had an inside scoop on spiritual matters. They had special insight into the truth. So if you wanted to know the true gospel, you needed to talk to them. You needed to, to listen to them. And it's these people, it's these heretics that John had in mind when he was writing this letter to this lady. Now, I need to tell you about a custom of that day and if you understand this custom, you'll even understand the book of 2 John a lot better. When ministers of the gospel traveled about during that day and time, they always sought out the home of a fellow believer where they could stay at no charge, of course. You see, hotels were primarily known as houses of prostitution. And there was all kinds of disease. I mean, you really didn't want to stay in a hotel if you could avoid it. Well, these itinerant preachers would move all over the place, relying on the hospitality of Christians, of Christian homes. You remember, do you remember when Jesus sent out the twelve? Remember what it says? He sent them out two by two in Galilee. Later, he sent out the 70. Remember how he sent them? He sent them out two by two. Why? Well, the Christian homes can accommodate two people. They couldn't accommodate 12. They couldn't accommodate the 70, of course. So they were sent out two by two. And he gave them instruction about where they should stay. 
how long they were to stay there. So as the apostles, the 70, and other preachers traveled about, they depended upon Christian hospitality. But guess what? The false teachers did as well. They were disseminated throughout the country. And they were relying on Christian hospitality. They would claim to be the true teachers of the gospel. They would introduce themselves as the true representatives of God. They'd seek a place to stay. And once they got into that home, they would begin to teach their lives. They would begin to make new converts. Well, Second John. John addresses this letter to a lady who was probably, theologians say, known for showing hospitality to preachers. Now, with that long introduction, you can now better understand what John's talking about <coughs> as we go through this very, very short book uh, that's only one chapter in length. And it'll take us three weeks to get through it. So let's get started, okay? Ready? You already know more. I bet you know more, get this, than 90 to 95% of all Christians. They don't want to bother with that kind of stuff. All right? In, in fact, let me tell you, I was visiting with a, with a preacher one time in a funeral home. We had gone to see a mutual friend, and he was a pastor at this independent church. And he asked me what materials we used within our church. What were the publishing houses that we used for our literature? And I began to name them. And he said to me, really, that's, that's a shame. And I said, what do you mean? He says, we only use the Bible. Nothing else. I said, really? So you never consult commentaries? You Never consult what other theologians have had to say. You never look back in history and study the hidden. No, we don't need to do that. All we need to do is study the Bible. I said, well, when you get into the pulpit, do you ever make any comments about the scripture? Or do you simply get out and read verbatim, word for word? The Bible says, oh, no, I explain it. I, I said, well, how is that any different? If someone took that and wrote it down, the things you were saying, would they be allowed to share that? I mean, the stupidity, the absolute stupidity of some people. So, but anyhow, most people don't bother with doing any background research, but, uh, but you do. Let's look at the verse. The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth. And we'll... We'll stop right there. John, who's writing this letter, the Apostle John, we know that, he refers to himself as the elder. And this was a common way of writing a letter. You know, today, when you and I write a letter, when do we put our name? At the end of it. Sincerely, Ken. Or the Reverend Kenneth E. Satcher III. Something like that. Yeah, we put it at the end. But at the beginning is how they did it back then. You identify who you are, which I think is pretty smart. I mean, because what do we do? If you pick up a letter to read it, you immediately go to the end of it to see who's writing this, and then you read. Well, they were just smarter than we are, I guess. They identified themselves at the beginning. The elder. Now, John would quite literally be an elder, right? Probably in his 90s. Uh, I mean, some of you folks are elders that are in your 90s. I see at least three people here that are in their 90s. John was in his 90s. But he was also an elder statesman in the church. Listen, the apostles were known. The apostles were important. They had first hand eyewitness of the Messiah. They had lived with him and traveled with him. 
Whatever he, they had to say, it was important. John was an elder in more ways than one. He was the last living apostle. And he was writing this letter to the lady chosen by God and to her children. Now, we've already seen this in 1 John. John often referred to believers as the chosen ones, the elect. These are God's people. These are the ones elected by God, chosen by God. You're special. We are special people. We are very special people. This was a particular lady of a certain household. Now the question is often asked, was she a widow? Maybe, but not necessarily. When it came to providing income to the family, you refer to the man of the house. When talking about the person who provided hospitality, then you refer to the lady of the house. It would be the lady providing hospitality to these itinerant preachers. And that's what's on John's mind as he's writing this letter. But since John addresses the letter to her children as well, this probably means, we surmise, that she was indeed a, a, wed, a widow because the husband, no husband, is mentioned at all. Now he mentions this lady as one whom he loves in the truth. He loves in the truth. truth two things I want to say about this statement. First of all, John mentions the word truth five times in these four verses. Five times he mentions the word truth. Truth happens to be his subject matter here. That's what he's writing to her about. Truth. It, it's the matter of truth that he's addressing. He's talking about truth because there were a lot of false teachers spreading lies. And since this lady had been and would continue to host preachers, he wanted her to know that all of them were not teaching the truth. But apparently she had learned the real truth. She knew the truth. But he was warning her that everyone who comes in the name of Christ doesn't necessarily represent Christ. In these next two letters, John emphasizes, he makes a priority, the matter of truth. And when, then we see where he addresses this woman, whose identity, remember, we don't know, as someone he loves in the truth. In other words, he loves her as a sister in Christ. And he loves the fact that she knows the truth. But not only does he love her, take a look at this, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in, in us, because of the truth which lives in us, and be, will be with us forever. Folks, I don't have to belabor the point on how important truth is. False information about anything is devastating. Even the coronavirus, there's false information that's going about. I, I mean, it's amazing. I find it hilarious. Uh, the Hindus over, I think it is in India, believe that drinking cow urine would protect them from the virus. Do you think that's dangerous? Oh, yeah. If you believe it, it's dangerous. Um, among other crazy, crazy things. But the truth is primarily a reference to the accurate word of God. As well as all who are part of what the accurate word of God teaches. Christians have the truth, John was saying. Christians love one another. There's even a love for believers that we don't even personally know. Have you ever met a believer and you felt a connection to them, a love for them, and yet you didn't even know them? Let me tell you of an experience of mine. 
I'm looking at the time. Got to get used to this new preaching. You know, I guess it's not new, is it? I've been preaching from 1045 to 12. But hang with me, I'm almost finished. I want to tell you about an experience of mine that I had when I was 19 years old. And I was pastoring a little church over in Pineville while I was going to LSUA and Louisiana College. Well, my church decided they wanted to send me to the Holy Land. I was 19 years old. They thought that would be great for me, beneficial for me, that this young preacher boy can learn so much. And so I was excited about it. And so they asked me about my schedule and the plans. And it was in August of 1977. It was only in August that I, I really had the time to do that. I was getting married in December. There was a lot of stuff going on in my life. But anyhow, I headed out to the Holy Land in August of 77. But they didn't want me to just go by myself. I needed to go with a, with a group. And so they uh, went to one of these, uh, what do you call those agencies? Travel agencies, yeah. They went to a travel agency, thanks. And, and they booked me a trip with a group. They didn't consult me about what group I wanted to go with. And it happened to be a Roman Catholic group. So I went to the Holy Land with a Roman Catholic group of, I would guess, 30 to 40 people. The whole group fit on one of these big, big buses. I think it was about 40 of us. And I was the only evangelical Christian in the group. There was one couple that uh, was Lutheran, but they fit in with the Catholics very, very well. Well, as it turned out, I had to go to Catholic Mass multiple times every day. The tour group scheduled me to visit all the Catholic shrines in Israel and other places. And uh, I wasn't enjoying myself as much as I had anticipated. And furthermore, I, I felt quite lonely and and out of place the entire time I was there. I felt ostracized and viewed as an outsider. In fact, they didn't even believe I was a Christian. I remember this doctor, this psychiatrist and his wife who pulled me aside and said, let us tell you something, young man. You aren't even a Christian because you do not belong to the true church. And, ooh, I mean, he's pretty intimidating. They were all intimidated. They, they didn't have much to do with me. About the friendliest anyone ever got with me was a Catholic priest in the group called me in the, on my hotel phone about 1 a.m. one morning and he said, Hey, why don't you come up to my room and spend a little time with me? <laughs> I don't think he meant... Let's pray together. But I was ready to go home. I was lonely. I was discouraged. And one day we had some free time. And we were in the city of Jerusalem. And I decided to just go for a walk. And I'm telling you, I've always been a crybaby. I remember walking down that street with tears running down my eyes. <laughs> oh, oh, my mommy. I want to go home. And I came upon. A church of the Nazarene. This beautiful building, the church of the Nazarene. I grew up in the church of the Nazarene. And when I saw it, I went, oh, someone I must have contact, something in common with. And I ran up to the, to the office door. Found the front doors were locked. I went around, there was an office door. I knocked on it and the pastor came. He spoke English. We hugged. We talked. I found out he was from Louisiana. We fell in love with each other. He was glad to see someone from Louisiana all the way over in Israel. What was that about? What was that about? The same thing right here. John loved her in the truth, but also all who know the truth. There's something in common. Let me finish up because I see what time it is. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ.
the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Grace, mercy, peace. That's a common New Testament benediction. You see it over and over and over. We receive it only through truth. Through the love that accompanies that truth. I'm talking about salvation, grace. I'm talking about salvation, mercy. I'm talking about salvation, peace. Those are the things that come to us through the truth. It has given me great joy, John says, to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. Is there anything more thrilling to know that your children are walking in the truth? Gail, Gail Tyler, you had this influence on me. This lady has a telephone conversation with family members every Sunday evening. They do Bible study and prayer requests and prayer. They all get on speakerphone. Well, on Wednesday mornings at 7 a.m., my daughter and I now in Denver, Colorado, we open our Bibles together. Get on speakerphone. And I pray for my little girl. And then she wants to pray for her daddy. And we study verse by verse the Gospel of John. There's something marvelous about knowing that your children are in the truth. John, in this verse 4, is actually beginning the body of of his letter. And he says, it has given me great joy. Now, let me just give you a little Greek lesson here. I mean, that word, it means he's overjoyed, he's exuberant, he's, he's rejoicing greatly to find out some information. Guess what the Greek word that is used there for overjoyed is? It's the word Eureka. Eureka, the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary defines Eureka this way, a cry of joy or satisfaction when one finds or discovers something. It means, I got it, I found it. Yes, Eureka. John says, I'm overjoyed. Eureka, over the knowledge that your children, your children are walking in the truth. Well, because of the time, I'm going to skip some more. I don't know why I've gone so long today. But we who know Christ, we live in the truth in the sense that it's the boundaries for our lives. It informs our thinking. It informs our speaking. It informs our acting. The truth does. The truth is our worldview. And John says, I was very glad to find among your children some walking in the truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. The Father has told us to walk in truth. And that's what you and I have received commandment to do. May God help us to do it. May God help us, each one, to walk in the truth and to love one another. Let's stand. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Oh, Father, what a joy to be able to teach and to see my brothers and sisters just soaking it up. Protect us from falsity. Help us to know the truth. But more importantly, to be guided by it. To live by it. Help us. Bless us, I pray, in the holy name of Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of His Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you, folks. Y'all have a great, great week.